territory is back. We're going to hear from Brandon Woodruff soon. And actually, that's the problem, Kratzy. The Brewers continue to weather the storm with injuries. And the latest, Willie Adamas on the concussion IL, who not only brings a ton on the field, he's been their best position player over the past couple of years, but he's also a spark plug. He's definitely a spark plug, but... Fortunately for them, they went to Midas and they're putting another spark plug in Bryce Terang at shortstop who has all the opportunity, all the ability to step in. Look at you trying to get us another sponsor on this show. Absolute savage move. Let's get to Brandon Woodruff, who is currently on the IL and get an update on his injury status. And also, Big Woo just wants to kick back and give us a little story time. I said, Woo! look, I ain't coming back on unless Lil Kane's on here. So, oh, <laughs> there's my guy. There's my other guy. <laughs> Woo, what's going on, Woo? Nothing, man. Just, oh, you know shoot. what it is. Getting through the season. Just go. I hear you, man. I hear you. Good to Hold see on, what's you. What's that man. shirt say? Retired? Retired. Man. I hung up my cleats. <laughs> yeah, I just want everyone to know. <laughs> I love oh, it. Man. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, Brandon. So, let's start with what we were talking about. I don't know if you caught any of it, but... It, Without most people knowing everything to a story, did you do you have a problem with a pitcher kind of you know doing this, looking towards the dugout when he's when he's celebrating and he just shoved against a team that he thought should have offered him money? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty different uh, in that aspect. I I feel like my mindset with this game is it's such a hard game. And if I'm not completely focused when I go out to try to make a pitch in a baseball game, um, things can go a little sideways. So I, I don't tend to show emotion. Um, but Locaine, the, one of the funniest things is he, he's like, I can tell when, he, when I'm getting pissed because my face starts getting red. I don't like giving up hits. So when, I, when that starts happening, the face starts getting red and then I start trying to get a little too mad, but I don't, I don't try to show too much emotion. Um, I mean, I just try to go out and do my job, make a pitch, get three outs, come in, sit down and, and try to do it again and do it as many times as I can. And, and that's the only thing I can focus on. Um, but you know, I say that I've been with one team my whole career, so I don't know what it's like on the other side playing against a former team or, you know, other stuff that's going on the on the other side of the dugouts, you know, with a team that, you know, kind of like you just described. Uh, I missed a little bit of what you guys were talking about, but um, I guess I'm a little bit different in that way. I just try to go out and get out and, and do my job, and that's it. No, and that's fair, and that's you. My thing is, because it's entertaining and it's cool and it brings a lot of juice to a May baseball game in the regular yeah. season. So if – if someone is celebrating or, or kind of motioning to your dugout, or we were talking about like Liam Hendricks, like, and there's been many others, especially closers who will like freak out and kind of act like the team is his ultimate like opposition, even if it's not to fuel them. Do you get pissed off or you're just like, cool, good for you. Um, and let's go get if it. If it's not disrespect, if you're not disrespecting the, the other team or one specific person, uh, I think it's fine. I, I think where you start to get to the point where you cross the line a little bit is when you're directly uh, disrespecting your opponent, uh, the game in a way, that's when you start to, to have a little bit of a problem. But um, if you're trying to fire your boys up and your team, and I mean, I don't, there's no problem with that. I mean, there's emotion in this game. Uh, people go about it different ways, but if it's in a, if it's in a good, uh, I guess, organic way, I don't know if that's the right word, but if it's not disrespecting the opposing team or, or, or the guy you're in the, you know, facing the box and I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I think it adds a little bit of uh, entertainment, like you said. But um, there is a line where you can cross it, and if you don't cross that, then there's there's no problem. Big Woo. Uh, for one, I want everybody to know, my guy, best left-handed hitting pitcher in the game. Okay? I don't hold know on, if you guys hold on, hold on. Do you got no, these no, no. questions pre-planned or what? No, no, I want to know. Guy, <laughs> All okay? right. You are my guy. You will always be my guy, okay? <laughs> I don't know if we have a clip. I always say, let's check the tape. Do we have a clip of, of Big Woo leaning on Kershaw? I mean, taking him way back. We will have it, I'm told, in about 120 seconds. 120 seconds. All right, well, Big we're going to check the tape in 120 seconds. Yeah, he almost, I mean, listen, I, I just, quick question. I just want to know, man, do you miss, do you miss stepping in that box or do you enjoy just focusing on, on just pitching now? Hey, like you said, man. 
That's the jungle out there in that box. And if you <laughs> if you ain't ready for it, it'll eat you up. No, it was great until they started throwing all speed and first pitch breaking balls, doubling up, pitching me inside, throwing me up, down, all this stuff. Y'all, you the hitters got to go through every day. And then that's when I started struggling, man. I was a little bit of a hitter, and then it turned into like. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm ready for the jungle, man. And it's just a, it's a fight out there every day. But I tell you what, last year I had a bat in my hand about every inning in between innings. This year, honestly, I ain't really touched one, man. I've kind of let that that part of it go. Um, and right now I'm I'm not I'm not playing I'm not pitching, and I show ain't hitting for a while. So um i just i've been going a little bit crazy man i can't sit still anyway so i might i actually i went in Sharger's equipment room the other day and grabbed a grab my old ap5 out sitting in the back and i've been carrying it around with me in the club out so uh but other than that i don't miss the hitting it's it that stuff's hard man but it was cool to be able to see the other guys on the other side and see what it's like but uh it ain't it, it ain't it ain't fun but i do enjoy the challenge now but i sit up on that top top step with the uh with the hitting coaches and i act like i know what i'm doing when i'm talking to them but um uh, <laughs> i know it's hard man it's it's hard wait yeah. are you allowed to use you use marucho oh here we go oh here wait, we go wow no. uh oh Woo! give us the low, play, low. Play, low. tell them about it man no, way back okay you know he's excited he's fired up right here yeah he don't show emotion <laughs> though hey let's keep playing let's keep <laughs> playing right. now as he's crossing home plate he almost broke my arm on the high five, but my arm bent the backwards, man. He almost broke my arm. He was so fired up, so excited. That's what I love about Big Boo, man. He enjoys All it, right. fired up. And like I say, when he's out there, man, it's 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 a joy to play behind him for sure. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. But look, the emotion part, man, I don't know what happened. I don't remember touching first base, and I don't remember what I did running all the way to home. I don't remember slapping Locaine's hand. So that part, I don't remember. I remember swinging the bat, and that's it. Nice, nice. Yeah, you just said you don't show emotion. There was a lot of emotion running around those bases. Hey, I, like I said, there. I don't remember it. I don't you know what happened. Out. Hey, I blacked so, out. That's it. You, you, you just said you're using an AP5. That's a Marucci bat, right? Yeah. Are you allowed to use those? You went to Mississippi State. Marucci was invented at in LSU now. I know that. That's what I used last year, and I didn't get a hit. And I, the home run was with a Louisville slugger. So, um and that was the Eric Sogard bat, and which I got a pretty cool story about that. Shogger, I just saw him for our, before I came in. He wanted me to give him a shout out, and this is the perfect opportunity to give him a shout out. I got a little backstory about this bat. So, um, hit the home run, everything's crazy. You know, we ended up losing that series in game seven, get back home, and my dad, my dad never like asked for anything. Um, and he's like, hey, he's like, you think you could get me that that bat that you hit the home run with? And I was like, sure, yeah, I'll call I'll call Shog up real quick or whatever. So I call him up and I was like, hey, do you by chance have the bat? He was in Milwaukee. This is off season. He's like, uh, he's like, I think they're they've they've already sent all the 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 bat and stuff in the truck down to spring training. I think it's there. So we'll we'll get it when we get there. So I show up, didn't forget first day. I said, hey Shog, you got you know you got that that bat? And he's like, yeah, let's go back here and look. So we're looking in the back can't find it right he's like well it's it, it's probably in milwaukee um i'm sure it's there we'll get it okay spring training's over show up in milwaukee the first couple of days i'm like hey you, you know let's let's go find that bat um go in the equipment room can't find it and now he's like now he's like full panic because he realizes that he doesn't exactly know where this bat is but he's like we're gonna find this thing so um come to find out the uh, assistant phil on the other side of, in Milwaukee, he told Phil to, uh, if any of the guys that aren't on the team, just take their bats and send them down to the minor league side. So I was using the Eric Sogar bat, had his name on it, whatever. Um, so long story short, the bat I hit the home run with got sent down to the minor leagues and probably what I figured happened got broke in the first live action that it took and it died a hero that way. And I never get to, got to give it to my dad. Uh, and I still hold that grudge against uh, Shogger, and man, it just and it crushes him every time we get to get to talk about it. But uh, I just I figured out he wanted a little shout out on the show, so I figured I'd give him a shout out in that way. That's that's the perfect way to give him a shout out. <laughs> nice. Shogger, Losing my Shogger bad needs man. To be on here. Shogger, Shogger needs to be on here. We're trying to get all types of you know people <laughs> in baseball, writers and pitchers and catchers yeah. and coaches. 
We need Shauger, the ultimate equipment manager of all time. So look, you talk about stories. Those guys have the best stories for sure. Incredible stories. Incredible. All right, Big Woo. Now the tough question. All right. How's the Brasso feeling, man? How's the arm feeling? Are we are you we know what? progressing? Yes. Uh, I played catch, so um, I took a, I, after the injury happened, I had uh, about four weeks where I didn't do much in terms of I didn't pick up a baseball. I was um, doing the strengthening and in the weight room a lot. Um, and then I uh, had a little bit of a, a little bit of a hiccup just with a normal ramp up. Uh, Might have went a little too quick, so I took a few days off, and I just started back throwing yesterday, and I felt amazing. So, um, hopefully, I'll just be on the on a straight trajectory up, and uh, just have a nice nice build up and and get back in game action. But um, as far as the past week or so, I've been feeling great and play catch. I'm gonna play catch again today here in a little bit, and um, just start back with a build up, man. It's uh, this is uncharted territory for me. I've never had a arm injury and pro ball. So I'm trying to navigate that a little bit. And, uh, but as of right now, I feel great. And I can't wait to, to get back out there and play. And I cannot stand sitting in the dugout watching. Are you traveling with them? Are you traveling with the team home and road? Yeah. I told them, uh, apparently they were going to try to play a, play a joke on me after the first day I got hurt. Uh, Wade Miley was trying to, to get this all planned with counts and, we were in Arizona when I had the MRI and I came in the next day and they wanted to try to tell me that I was going to stay back in Arizona. And, um, I think counts didn't kind of want to go through with that, that joke. He, he said, not, not this soon. So, uh, I guess i I guess I come off as a, a mean guy. I don't, I don't really know. I, you know, I, I probably would have been pissed off, but you know, if that was what they wanted to do, I, we were going to have to settle it, but, uh, they were going to have to tell my wife, and my little girl that they were going to go to Arizona, not me. So, uh, but I am with the team, um, and thankfully I am with the team because I'll probably go crazy, um, and I'm able to do everything with them. And I, I try to get in early and, and get out of the way so I'm not interrupting the guys who are healthy and, and playing in the game, and I try to get out of their way so I'm not a, I'm not a burden. So, Do you get bored? Because I, I can't imagine being out. I was never out for this long of a time. But do you get bored? Because I think it would be boring as hell. You come in, you do – you do 20 minutes of this, and you do 20 minutes of shoulder stuff, and then you're like, now I got seven hours to do jack shit. Well, you just go around and you just talk a lot of crap. That's what you do. So, <laughs> uh, I, man, you know, I, I keep myself – I don't know. Yeah, I do a lot of talking. Uh, Ozzy, our, our hitting coach, he's always on me. He's, he's like, uh, he, he, I never shut up. So, uh Low and, and Kratzy can attest to that. I just, I just want to talk to people, man, in the clubhouse. I just want to go up and talk and hang out. So I pass the time that way. But, yeah, it gets a, it gets a little boring when you don't get in that five-day routine and um, and you look up and you're, you're getting a pitch, you know, you know, so quick. And it's already – guys are already 10 outings in for starters. So I definitely get bored in that sense. Um, but I do have stuff to, to keep me busy, and I do like to talk to a lot of folks. So no, that passes the time. So today marks the anniversary for Ryan Braun's first ever game in the big leagues. Do you spend more or less time on the training table now than Braun would getting <laughs> massages when he was healthy? Oh, God bless, man. Uh, that's tough, man. I'm on the aisle, so I'm supposed to be on the table getting ready. But I'd like to say I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even close. So I'm going to stick with that. I ain't even close, man. Not it. So another good little story, uh, Brian Anderson, I guess he had caught wind that, you know, Bronny, Bronny liked to come in and he'd put the hot pack on his back. And that was kind of his thing as soon as he got to the field. So, um, and loosen up. And I guess he heard that Bronny did that a lot. So he, uh, he come into the training room the other day and he was like, uh, they were like, you know, you can either get in the hot tub, warm up a little bit, or we can put a hot pack on you. He's like, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, He's like, I don't want to get made fun of. So, no, nobody's going to make fun of you. Go ahead. You don't have to get – just put a hot pack on. He put the hot pack on, and I was somewhere, and he come, he come walking out of the training room, and I was like, what's up, Ronnie? And he kind of looked at me. He walked, kept walking through the door, and he came back, and I got, like, this desk there, man. So I don't know if I, I want to mess with him anymore, but um, I guess that still floats around. But I, I wouldn't say I'm on the training table as much as, as, much as he is. Not, not now. Hey – when you come back and you're making rehab appearances, 
what's the plan? How does that work? I mean, obviously you still got some time, but are you going to yeah. like, you know, make the phone call, find out where, where the best, I mean, it's usually in a kind of middle of nowhere spot. Yeah, so. but no, but you pick, you try to pick your schedule. So you're at home. You want to pitch at home, right? So your first one out, you don't want to pitch on the road. So he'd pitch at home. Right. But and I'm then, talking about the food order too. Then on top of that, uh, you he know better, yeah, he's buying everyone's. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Oh. So like, oh. give, give, give me the whole 100%. process there of how that works. Right. Like, when, when we fast forward, whenever it is, a few weeks, and you're like, all right, ready for rehab. Like, what's the combo? Yeah. How do you get yourself at home? How do you set up the food to take care of everyone and for them to be like, oh, shit, this guy's legit. So the the great thing is having Appleton, which is like an hour and a half away. Um, if, if they're at home, I can literally do everything here and just literally drive over on the day I got to go throw in this pitch and come right back. Uh, so that's the easiest. Nashville's pretty close. I mean, that's a short flight. Um, so like last year I threw an Appleton, I got in the car and drew, drove over. Um, and basically when you show up to the field, you just get with the clubby there. And I, and I, I had already talked to him at that point, but I told him, I was like, you know, what, what do the guys want? I'll get them whatever they want. Um, and I think I, I can't remember what I ended up getting them. Um, but you just bomb spread. As soon, so you take care of that. As soon as you get to the field, they ask you what you need. Um, and you already kind of come with everything you need, but that the first thing you take care of is you go see the manager, go talk to him, go talk to the staff, and then uh, you get all the the uh, food order and everything, you know, squared away, and uh, get that situated so the guys can enjoy a good meal after the game. And uh, because when you go to the minor leagues, man, it's bad. There's some there's some bad bad food and bad uh, stuff going on. So if you can just help those guys out and give them a good meal, it ain't even got to be anything really nice, but just something different um maybe like outback or chick chick-fil-a is a, a big hit but um i think i ended up doing texas roadhouse last year for them and uh steaks and and uh baked potatoes and stuff like that so they uh they really like that and then go go pitch and and this was the first time i think i realized last year to loosen up a little bit i show up and this place is like packed you know it's an hour and a half from milwaukee and it's like sold out. There's like 6,000 fans there. The place is packed. They're having like a, a little league, uh, little league. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it. They brought out a bunch of teams. So they're like, I'm like warming up in center field. And these kids are just like giving me high fives. And, you know, usually when I'm getting ready for a game, I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing. So that was really the first time I, I come through there giving them high fives and was having fun. And um, so it, it's pretty cool to go back. You don't ever want to go rehab and go back down, but you, you, um, you appreciate that part of it going back and seeing, you know, how really bad it was. And now you're in a spot where you can help those kids out and they'll remember that even if it's just a good meal. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what it looks like. That's good. Yeah. You got to buy Cracker Bro because you love Cracker Bro. I once bought Cracker Bro. I love it. it was great. It was fat. Chicken and dumplings in a little pan. It works out perfect. You get all the stuff, yeah. all the sides and fixings. But if you go play for the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers, have you ever milked a cow? No, I haven't. Okay, I haven't. So, and okay, so no. So Kratz, he's the other day he wore a Timber Rattlers hat, and their name was the Wisconsin Utter Tuggers. Now you went to Mississippi State, and I told you my daughter's going yeah. to Mississippi State, and there ain't nothing but yeah farms around there. So you yeah. need to pitch, and you need to request the Utter Tuggers uniform. And I hope <laughs> Kratz went and got the hat because it would be absolutely perfect for you. Oh, God. Well, last year, I don't know if you saw this. Last year I threw there, I show up, they give me this jersey, and it's like, I'm talking, it goes down past my knees. It's huge. And I'm like, man, I can't I can't wear this jersey. Uh, so they ended up, got in the, in the clubby there, freaking, you want to talk about freaking out? Oh, God, the jersey doesn't fit. You know, it ain't like the, in the big leagues where you got your stuff custom to you, whatever. And he's freaking out trying to find a jersey. He's scrambling. He's like, all right, try on your pants. I try on the pants where they're like wearing a like a garbage sack. They're huge, man. I'm like, I can't wear these pants either. Luckily, I brought my pants. So I went into the manager, Joe Aroll. I said, Joe, he was my first uh, pro ball manager in 15 when I got in. And I said, Joe, I can't wear these pants. They're either super skin tight or they're huge. I said, I'm going to have to wear my cream pants. And is that okay? So he okayed it. So what they had is I had the cream pants. And they had a, like a white jersey. Ended up getting a white jersey that fit. Um, so I was out there rocking a, 
rocking my rehab start rocking a uh, white jersey with cream pants and it was it looked awful but um you know it, it worked out so it's um but next time i tell you what if I, I i haven't heard of that jersey is that the one where they got the cow print on it i think i've i've might have seen that one it's right here big wheel they'll change the camera oh look at that look at them udders that's that's, that's all you kid that's all you that that is sick. Yeah. If, when I go back there and rehab, if I go back and rehab there, I'm going to, I'm going to request that uniform. And you got to buy the boys a little sign. You got to be creative. You got some time. This is a little longer IL stint for you. And I saw what you're making in arbitration. The boys down there know what you're making in arbitration. So I heard what you said, Texas Roadhouse. I need you to be here. You're at a, you're at like an eight or nine. I need you to be a 10. Ruth's Chris. All right. Well, Texas Roadhouse might be the fanciest place they've got in these towns when you go to it. So you might have to this? give me some suggestions. <laughs> How about this? How about we go a pregame Chick-fil-A, some nugs. Yeah. A postgame Texas Roadhouse. And maybe some J's for the boys down there. Everybody gets a, gets a pair of J's. Ooh. A pair of J's. Well, if I was, listen, <laughs> I'm an Adidas guy. So, <laughs> I'll have to. Adidas would love that. He's, he's, come on, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to hook him up with some Adidas, not Jays, man. I'm Team Adidas. Maybe some Costas. But hey, I can handle hey, that's a, that's got a, I got some Costas on. Yeah. Maybe everybody needs some. I mean, minor league boys, they need, hey, they need some, they need some stuff. You know what? That's a good idea. And I, I'm a very giving person. So. You know what? I, I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind. Just think about it. You're, you're, yeah, you're, a, guy. Like you're a generous guy. You can do it. Oh, yeah, people yeah. know. People know. I mean, that story, what was it? Maybe the first interview we did with you, the first combo earlier in the season, about yeah. buying, buying some food for random people, picking up oh, their yeah. tabs. That got around. Yeah. Love it. And Locaine, Locaine, pretty generous too. He bought us a bunch of video cases one day. And I, this is when I was like, this is when my eyes got open to the big leagues a little bit. I was like, actually, I got a couple of stories: the Miami story, and then the uh, this the 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 games <laughs> games thing. So, well, okay, man, he, I'm 18, uh, debuted in 17, up for a little bit, and then 18, I was up and down like six times, and 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 Low Kane was like the one veteran when I would come up and down that would really just like sit down and talk to me, like and just have fun with me and mess with me. I was like, oh, okay, this is my guy here, so these little traveling game cases started coming out where you could take your console with you and it's got a TV in it and you just put it in there and flip it up, plug it in and, and play your video game. So we're, we're all talking about them. Maybe one guy's got one here. Well, look, I was like, well, just take a piece of paper around and see who all wants one. And I was like, wow. I was like, dang, that's, that's big time. I've never seen this before. Like this guy's going to buy everybody a case. Well, you had folks who ain't never picked up a, a, a game of controller, don't even know what Xbox, PlayStation is. They was writing their name down. You know, we had like 25, like the whole team, had like 25 folks buy one. I don't know how much it was. Low. It was, I mean, it was quite a bit of money, but he's just like, here you go, boom, bought it. A week later, these things are in the clubhouse. And I was like, this is the coolest freaking thing ever. And I'm like, if I ever get to this point, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to do stuff like that and, and, and try to take care of the boys. So then we get to Miami and I was hurt at this time in 19 with my, uh, oblique and I'm starting to come back and, uh, Gio Gonzalez was with us. He's from Miami. He, um, he had a buddy down, down there that had a Lamborghini and I was like, Oh man, I've never even seen one of these before. Like I'm from Mississippi. They, these things ain't even heard of. I was like, I just want, he's like, you can come see it. I was like, all right, cool. I want to come, I want to come over to your house and see it, whatever, sit in it, whatever. So show up to the game that night and, uh, we're sitting in the dugout. He's like, he's like, big woo, turn around. Gio was like, big woo, turn around. His buddies are sitting behind the dugout and they've got a Lamborghini key and a Ferrari key. And they're like jingling them. They're like, oh, he's like, you're going to get, you're going to drive one. And I said, oh no. I said, look. I don't know. These things are like spaceships. These are like, I don't know what's going on, but I said, I ain't driving these things. He said, yes, you are. So good thing we won the game. So we come in the, the clubhouse where, you know, we got the music going. We go into the food room and Gio's and Counts walks in and Gio's like, Count. He's like, Big Woo's going to, he's like, he's going to drive it. And I'm like, 
pro, like, hey, I got to get on the bus. Like, I got to ride the bus back to the hotel. There's zero chance I'm not going with the team. Like, I know my place here. Like, I'm I'm gonna hop on the bus, do the whole thing. I'm not I'm not going by myself. And he's like, he's like, Big Woo's gonna drive a Lamborghini, you know, this weekend. And Council's like, oh, that's sick, man. You know, have fun. But once he said that, I was all in. Like, I got over the hump of like got the manager's approval. So we show up this white Lamborghini, brand new 2020 at the time. I get in this thing, crank it up, and it had 83 miles on it. And I'm like, oh my God, what? I said, what am I doing, man? I, I'm sweating like it. It's got all these buttons in it and stuff. And I'm too big for the car. So I had it for the whole weekend. I'd valet it and I'd, and I'd drive a different guy to the field every day. Well, the last night I had it, it was my wife's birthday. We were having a little birthday dinner for her, and all the wives and stuff were already uh, at the place in downtown. And um, so I was like, "Low man," I said, "Let's hop in the Lambo and let's let's go cruise. Let's you know, let's go meet them, and we'll go we'll go have dinner." So we get in there, we drop the top. You know, it's a beautiful night, Miami. We're in this Lamborghini, and you know, everybody's looking at us. And we pull up to the to the valet. I've never been to this place. I don't even know where this place is. Pull up. Well, I like pull past the valet, miss it. And I'm like, oh my God, like I can't, I can't park this thing. The guy's like, no, you can pull it in. So I just put this thing in reverse, you know, just not the the right etiquette to have a Lamborghini. I just throw this thing in reverse and back it in. And the guy goes, Do you want to park it out front? Or do you want to uh put it in the garage? And I'm looking at Lowe, like, I, I think we should put it in the garage. I don't want nobody to see this thing. Lowe's like, nah, man. He's like, we're gonna leave it out front. And the guy goes, it's either 50 bucks to park it in the, in the, uh, in the garage, or it's like, I don't know, a hundred bucks to, to, to leave it out front. He's like, no, we're going to leave it out front. So we get out. And he said, he said, uh, we get out. He hands him like, I don't know, I hand him a couple hundred bucks. He's like, here, man. He's like, it ain't nothing to a boss. <laughs> and I was like, he looked at me and said, big boy, it ain't nothing to a boss. He said, these pockets are heavy. And when he said that, man. I was like, all right, this is it. Like, if I can ever make some low cane money, I'm gonna take care of the boys. <laughs> that's my that's my that's my favorite Lamborghini Miami story I've had. And I don't think anything's gonna top that. But it we just pulled up and he just he just he just reached in his pocket, handed the guy the money, he goes, He like, just keep the change. It ain't nothing to a ball. And when he said that, I about lost it, man. I about lost it. <laughs> Look at look at Low and Low. You're just playing it cool, just like you did with stealing bases on my knee here. Oh. Like, oh, I'm just chilling in Oklahoma with some with some farm <laughs> animals. No, you're you're driving the Lambo, just tipping a couple hundo, leaving wow. it out front. I love you, Big Woo, man. You're the man. <laughs> if y'all need proof of that, I got pictures. We were taking pictures in front of the Lamborghini, the whole thing. It was fun. Woo. Was it, it was, conver- was I'm assuming it was like a hurricane. Lamborghini? It was a, uh, yeah, it was the Huracan Evo Spider. It was like, the, it had just come out for that year. So my, bu- my buddy of mine had one, and he let me take my daughter to homecoming court, and he had to drive around. So he gives it to me, and it's I, and he's same, about the same size as me. I couldn't fit in it. So the only way I could drive it is I had to put the top down because I was too tall. And then the windshield was like right here. So I'm driving down the highway, yep. and I can't decide if I'm supposed to go under the yep. top, <laughs> over the top of the windshield because it was too short. So I get out and I got a line on my forehead and it's from the wind, wind burn on my forehead that was over because I went yeah. under. So I'm driving this thing yeah, down the highway yeah. <laughs> and I had a wind burn on my head because it was too big. So I, it's it was, not like you're six, six or something it, like, they, dude, they I'm made, telling you, who's it for? It's for I, five. Apparently years. my buddy's a little short fat guy. So apparently it's for him. <laughs> <laughs> look like Dino. Look like Dino in the in the Lambo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, good story. We yeah, appreciate it. Obviously, we'll try and get low on as much as we can when we bring you on. Good to see you, bud. We'll, we'll catch up again in a few weeks and, and keep on that recovery trail. Yeah. All right, fellas. Have a good one. Well, Kratzy, are we going to go a show without talking about Jackson Cheerio? Answer: Nope. Walk off homers. All around power, snapped a little hitless skid for him. He showed that he was human for five seconds and also playing some sweet D. Absolutely. This is what a guy like this with the tools he has can do. Yes, everybody goes through ups and downs. Yes, he's the youngest player in the league. Yes, he's really freaking good.
Yes, he is their top prospect. And eventually he's going to have to deal with bench coach Pat Murphy when he makes it to the big leagues. Good luck to you, Jackson. And let's hear from Pat. Our conversation with him obviously was hilarious. I mean, it's Pat Murphy. What other introduction do you need? The guy is... Who did you steal that shirt from? Like, there's no way. Like, is that is that your line? Is that your is that like your you're the hitting coach now? You got a hit shirt. H I T. Jace Peterson had it and gave it to me. I don't turn down free shirts. So, why are you sweating? Did you just tie your shoes or put on your socks? (laughs) I was out in the field with my four year old, my eight year old, with Wade Miley and Pedro uh, throwing diving catches. (laughs) How's Wade doing? He's awesome. He's he's on the mend. He's 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 throwing he's throwing to the little kids, and the trainers are having a having a fit because he's not the supposed to throw. <laughs> Wait, are you in are you in Council's office? No, I'm in uh, Shogger's office. Oh, it's okay. actually my office. It's actually my office. I tell Shogger, let him use it. But Wade should just tell the trainers that's part of the rehab, right? You throw diving catches to the kids. Wade rehabs in a different way than anyone else. Anyone who knows Wade knows you just you just have to, to know him to understand him. He's got enough dirt in his spikes. I, I think he earned it. So, hey, Pat, give us the, uh, the broad view of what this team looks like right now. How much fun are you having, and, and what are your Ooh. thoughts? Well, I mean, we faced some adversity, obviously. you got three of your starters down now, um, three of your starting pitchers, one big woo. I mean – you know, he sets the tone. He just comes at you. He has a way about him that having him out of there changes things. You know, being the small market team we are, we don't have the depth. Um, so it's been rough. It's been rough. Um, and then to lose Wade Miley. But, you know, when you lose Wade, he's only been healthy for the full season one time in the last four or five years. But he brings so much to your clubhouse. So he's still doing it. You know, he's still here every day talking to young players, helping young guys. So he's, uh, Kratzy, you remember in 18, the, the impact he had. Um, and uh, so so losing him's big, but at least we keep his clubhouse presence. Now Eric Lauer's down. He hadn't been throwing the ball the way he wanted. So we're kind of decimated on the mound. We've got, uh, you know, Mitchell went down early. Um, he was playing really good and the difference maker in our lineup with his speed. And then uh, Urias hasn't played all year. So we've been just trying to piece it together. And um, there's been moments that look like, yeah, we could be okay. And then there's been moments that, uh, yeah, you're like, ooh, we need some help. Who's taken over the uh, – who hits the best infield pop-ups now that Moustakas isn't there anymore? <laughs> Moose, the silo ball. Moose was the <laughs> – so these, you guys don't know this, but um, Kratzy knows it. I would keep two charts <laughs> taped up on the wall that never came down in the dugout. One was Travis Shaw's broken bats, and the next was Moose's silo balls. And they'd both be so pissed. And they would come back, hit a silo ball, and break a bat, and I'd be over there with my marker just tallying it up. And uh, hopefully I was trying to bring some some levity to the situation, but... Then the timing wasn't always right, but uh, would, uh, Moose, Moose can hit him like nobody else. You would definitely, and you would wait too. Like there's plenty of time. The pop up would go up, and if you were pissed, you would just go right over and just mark it and not make a big deal out of it. But if you, if that grin, that's the grin right there. If you had that grin <laughs> on, you would wait and you would watch them walk down the dugout, and then as they'd walk by, you put their bat or broken bat. <laughs> Or helmet in the rack, you would be like, <clears throat> and then you would mark it <laughs> as they would come by. So that's that's just a little, that's just a little piece of uh, Pat Murphy. That's what he brings, including bagels, in his sliders uh, to every nah, day he, game. Tell us where that started. I'm not sure, Kratzy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it ever happened. I don't remember it as well as you do, but. Um, <laughs> I like to share a snack before a game once in a while and share a bagel. It's kind of like a connection thing and uh, ask the guys to stay connected. So oftentimes they do. I got Mitchell on it. Uh, Brasso t- took a piece, then find out where it came from and then ask for another. <laughs> I think you, one of your best qualities, I think, as a, a manager, as a coach, I think is you like to 
the way you dig into these players, you're testing their mental toughness each day. I think you want to see what they got and if they have it each day. I think you expose people who are not maybe the toughest, I think, and you try to get the most out of them. I could go on numerous stories just from college alone, but uh, it appears you have continued to do so to where you like to check in and how your team, how your players, uh, yeah. if they're ready for the nine innings that day. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, Kip, you say that because in a real serious note, like I really do want to impact guys or keep them on track. You know, like I'm not here to, to dominate them or to necessarily change them. I just want to impact them by saying, you know, keep your your head down and your wheels on the road and, you know, realize this is a team, realize there's a next pitch. You can't be, you can't be down about the last pitch or the last result. There's a next pitch that you have to be your best self for. Anyway, some of what I do is misunderstood from the outside, but I think on the inside, you can see that my intent is really good. I'm not just a hard ass trying to beat you over the head. You know, it's like my intent is, is, is good. And, uh, I don't know if it's effective or not, but, you know, I got a locker today, so I'll hopefully I'll have one tomorrow. Must be doing, must be doing something right. I think one of, one of my favorite stories is from – I don't even know if you remember this because there's just the countless stories that come from, from Packard and Tempe at this time. I think some junior pitcher, sophomore or junior pitcher, came in, walked two in a row. You took him out. We had a meeting after the game or something. We still won the game, and you just started laying into him. And then you're like, you need to pitch better. And then you looked at this red or this freshman right there. He's like, because I don't want to put this guy in. Do not make me put this guy in next to you. And you're See, just those testing everyone. Stories are made up. Those are made no, up. No, they're not. No, they're not. No. See, that's you know, you know who did this the other day? Rowdy Telez. Rowdy Telez made up a story about when he first met me, and everyone believes it, and it's a total lie. Um, and you know, because you know. Rowdy told it with such, you know, enthusiasm. People really believe it. And now you're doing it right now. I remember that day. I remember that day. I said, look, don't worry. You won the game. We got through it. You will never walk three batters in a game while you're here because I will always take you out after two. <laughs> hey, Murph, just so you don't feel bad, Rowdy came on this show and he made up a story about me that I told him to F off when he was a kid in San Francisco. So, when you see Rowdy and he puts that cheese head on, hit him over the head with it for me, okay? Because he did it. I need to tell him. Me. No, it's real. I mean, he told a story that he he we traded for him and he came to the Mets, and or he came while we we're playing the Mets, and I get to the field first, and he's laying on the couch, which he does well, and um, <laughs> he's a new player, and he said I threw my shoes at him and said, "Hey, clean these, clubby." Now everybody believes that he looks like a clubby, and and, and uh, doesn't look like a ball player, but I didn't do that. I've never had the clubby clean my shoes yet, but um, everybody believes it. You know. What would you What would you tell your younger self as a coach back when you are? And and I'll before you answer that. Before you answer that, I will back up what you just said about impacting guys. Because when I quit playing. You texted me and you were like, well, whatever you do, make sure you find something that you impact people. So this is something that Pat lives by, but we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to build you up too much. Yeah, that's no What way. would you tell yourself now that you didn't know as a young coach? Because AJ is a young coach and he wants to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, I mean, this profession is sacred and the problem is there's no qualifications for it. Maybe if you played a little bit, and that's been proven that that doesn't always help. And, you know, the profession needs people without an ego that wants to be an offensive lineman, that wants to open holes, that wants to let the other guys run through it and dance in the end zone and do what they have to do. But the profession is to open holes. And, you know, it's about love and discipline. And the ones toughest to love lead to, need to love the most. And... Um, if I understood any, I mean, I was, I was just an idiot when I was young and just, it was all about winning and, and I had a football mentality and it was about winning and nothing was going to stand in the way. And because I racked up a bunch of wins and got a bunch of big jobs, people thought I was good, but I wasn't because I didn't understand, you know, the role of the coach still, it wasn't just to win. It was to pre prepare these guys. Great. 
to be able to stay connected, be ready for the next pitch, stay kind of in their process and just play the best and learn how to compete. And, you know, sometimes guys don't know how to compete, no matter what background they came from, a tough kid from the streets or a, a soft kid from the suburbs in, in uh, Illinois. They don't always know. <laughs> I know you heard that. Yeah. I know you heard that. Yeah. They don't always know how to compete, but some of them do. In Kip's case, of course, he knew how to compete, and he just needed someone to believe in him and love him. And oftentimes, you know, when you look back in your coaching, if you're satisfied with it, you're not doing the job. There's so much we could have done different. There's so much we could have helped with um, that that we just our ego gets in the way. So this has been a great, great life for me. I feel like I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to be consistently, um, you know, consistently prepared and potentially impactful um, on a consistent basis. And I'm 64 years old. And people think I'm too old, but it's like, it's silly because I'm better than I've ever been and more aware than I've ever been. So as you take on coaching, when the ego's involved, it, you know, when when the loss creates that black hole inside of you and you take it personally, that's not right. You know, you should be preparing to rally these young men to get to the next stop, not just in their career, but the next game. To be clear, you know, to be convicted, playing that next game and not to be bogged down by the result or the standings or any of that other BS. Right. Well, I think I'm, I'm living proof of... Uh your impact. I don't think I'd be here, obviously, being able to interview. I think that's pretty cool that uh, I can honestly thank you for getting all the way to this point. Um, and I could prove that you're getting a little softer. I think maybe the best version I've seen of you was probably two years back uh, in the stands at ASU getting to watch Kai play for Arizona <laughs> State. I think that was one of the coolest moments I've seen. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the first time I've seen you nervous around a baseball field. Um, so what was that like getting to just be a father and not a coach yeah. and getting to watch Kai play? I know he's with the Padres now, right? Yeah. Yep. In, uh, in minor leagues, but that had to be pretty sweet to see him go back there. Yeah. You know, I didn't want him to go there. Um, um, but that's what he, that's what he chose and he made the most of it and uh, did well, but being in the stands, watching him. And again, it made me a better coach when he was born. It made me a better coach. I realized, Oh, everybody loves their kid the way I love my son. Oh my God. You know, I better be a little more respectful. Or then watching him play, I can think of all, I thought of all the dads out there watching their kids play and um, not having the experience I have in the game. So not to be able to watch it in a critical way. Um, but what a, what a great thing. And having you there, Kip, and uh, the way to see your success, no, no kidding, to see your success, that kid that came in um, hungry as you were and just you got a book scholarship and you just made the most of it. And you just instantly impacted our team and um, you wanted to win. And I knew you were going to be a successful professional and uh, that's to say the least. I'm not sure I picked up those books though, but we, we made it there on the back end. <laughs> there. The education system has to change. Kim, <laughs> hey, Murph, you... I, I always bring this up when people talk about, like, how do the Brewers keep making it? How do they keep making it? And I point to the coaches. I point to you. I talk, you know, I point to a big person that I always point to because these guys that are out there and are doing what they're doing, they're told what they're supposed to do. They're told, hey, you know, they're built up and they're just getting the most value is a guy like Counts. Counts is kind of a lame duck right now. No contract. No. Like – Counts can work anywhere he wants, man. The counts, counts, counts can call the shots right now. He's he's um, he can if he wants to stay here in Milwaukee. I'm sure he can. I'm, I, I don't know the particulars, but how can you not be pleased with the way this guy has developed into a great manager? And he's and, and he's aware he has to get better. He's not a guy that this is the way I do it. You know, um, he's he's terrific, man. He's a great decision maker. You know. You know, bad personality, but great, great decision maker. Um, not funny, but great decision maker. Um, and he, and he, win, he knows how to win. He knows how to handle a bullpen. He knows how to handle a pitching staff and he wins games. And he's, and the guys love him because you guys all know 
you want to be able to walk in that guy's office and get the honest truth. And they all get it every single time. And he ain't candy coated. I promise you, you know, I'm kind of a candy coater. I want you to come in and feel good. And then I want to kind of break it to you kind of softly. He counts as like, boom, you know, um, he's really, really talented, man. I here, I coached him for four years. I was brutal to him, by the way, but, um, here, I'm in my eighth year working for him, and I've learned more from him, more from him than he ever could have taken from his experience with me. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. I really am. So if him and his great calves, because you didn't mention how great of calves he has, don't come back and manage next year, are you willing to take over the job? And should you be the first one to take it? No, I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't even thought of that, Kratzy. I can't see him not coming back and managing here, but. But Brady's playing. Brady's, you know, he's got to go watch his Big Ten games. Yeah. Um, and Jack will be at – Jack, his younger one, is going right. to Michigan unless he signs. Um, and uh, so I just don't think that's going to be a, a question. I think he's just going to sit back and um, think about it. And, uh, yeah, I don't even consider that. It doesn't seem right to be in Milwaukee without counts. Murr, I didn't play for you. I don't – really know you other than you've talked a lot of shit to me over the years when I came in <laughs> or when I was playing against it you. Worked so both that's ways. Fine. It worked both ways. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of guys that played for you. And they told me some, you had some crazy rules. So tell me the craziest rule you had as a college coach. Pedroia used to say, if you hit a ground ball, you had to, or made an out, you had to run back to the home plate and give a high five to the, to the next hitter. So what were the crazy rules you had in college? Well, that particular one, I don't know that. I had one rule, don't misrepresent the program. And I'll be the judge if you misrepresented it. Um, <laughs> the, the, the thing about dapping the guy up from behind you, it was like we wanted to stay connected. So every time you made an out before the next guy went to the plate, you dapped him up. Like, hey, you take over. You know, and um, ah, that's a little college thing. and It, it was kind of cool. Other teams started doing it. But um, – if you struck out, you walk past the guy, you look them in the eye, boom. Even though you're ticked off, it ain't about you. You know, it's about it's about passing the baton. You know. Um, why don't you, you do don't that just, in the big leagues? Why don't you do that in the big leagues? You know, have have a, Christian Yelich go up to Rowdy Telez and be like, "Yeah, dude, let's go. It's your turn." Well, because the way you said it isn't isn't the intent. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of like a real thing of connection and. You know, you're making it out like a cheerleading thing. But anyway. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's how it plays to us not on the inside of these programs. We, yeah, I didn't play for you. That's why That's why telling you my rules um, won't make any sense to you. It was for the room. The guy's in the room. You know, but okay. um, there was no – there wasn't a lot of rules. You couldn't talk to the opponents. That was another thing. Like, you, you had – Counts got in trouble. Sean Casey came out on whatever channel he's on and said, you know – Council was the nicest guy in the world, but he never talked to me on base. I couldn't understand it. And finally, I asked him, you know, why? And he said, well, my college coach had a rule. You don't talk to opposing players. And just tell him one thing. Hey, man, I'd love to talk to you, but my coach is a real jerk. And uh, he can't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he, Casey brought it out and said, yeah, well, Pat Murphy, you're the reason, whatever. But um, You're the reason yeah, why everyone hated me too, Pat, because you taught me that when I played for you. So I didn't talk to the other team either. So thanks for that. I I understand his pain. No, but uh, no, we had, uh, I just wanted them to focus on, on the right stuff. You know what I mean? It wasn't about how you wore your hair, how you wore your hat or whatever. Uh, Merrill Kelly came to our program and uh, Kip, I don't know. You remember this? No, you were gone. Merrill Kelly came to the program and in recruiting, he said, Hey, Murph, I'm not going to wear my pants up, man. I don't, I don't wear those knickers. I don't do that. I need to wear my pants down. And I said, well, fine. Wear them any way you want. And the guys looked at me like, Murph, there's no way you're going to let him wear them any way you want. I'm like, no, he'll be fine. So he came out in fall practice for like three days with his pants down and digging it. And, uh, and then day four, he came out with his knickers. I'm like, Merrill, what happened, man? I was starting to really like those. And he's like, he just stared at me like, you knew you know, you knew I, you knew I'd have them up, but you get to the point where the players run the program. You just want to make sure the players are the right type of guys, you know, and they're who's, thinking, right. Who's your favorite player you ever had? And who's the best player you ever had? 
Yeah. Can't answer either of those questions because favored in, in different ways, you know. Um, yes, you can. No, I can't. I mean, Pedroia was awesome. Pedroia was awesome. Hey, you didn't say Cody Decker, which he said you would say, so thank you. Did he say that? He said that <laughs> in the interview that, we yeah. did with him yesterday. <laughs> ask Murph who his favorite player was and then ask him why it was Cody Decker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love Cody. Great, great guy. Um, <laughs> it looks like it. It looks and sounds like it. You just can't I stop do. talking about it. And he just can't give enough praise. <laughs> no, no, I do, but I, I'm – you know, again, he was making a joke about that, and I'm I'm making a joke about it too. No, I enjoyed Cody was in AAA and and uh, had two real good seasons and and added added a lot to our clubhouse and um, yeah. But like when I asked, you know, when somebody asked the old coach, you know, like who's your favorite player ever? Who's the best player you ever coached? Well, that's kind of for a coach. That's kind of I mean, I've got many guys. I got Kip's jersey up in my house. I got. Uh, the Willie Bloomquist and the Craig Councils and the Dustin Pedroia's, Andre, Brett Wallace. I mean, I had some some uh, some great players that I coached in college and uh, in the big leagues. I look at, you know, the guys you got hosting this show, Kipnis, Brock Holt. I was only with him like 60 days, and I call him Bernie. Bernie Holt was one of my favorites. He would still be a brewer if he didn't step on a ball and twist his ankle. Um Lorenzo Kane, you know, one of the greats. Um, you want to talk about teammate. You want to talk about coming to play, unsung hero. And then uh, you got Kratz right there. What a joy to see a guy. I don't know. How old were you then, Kratz? 45, 40, 46? <laughs> but this guy came off the scrap heap. He hadn't, he hadn't caught a ball in months. And all of a sudden, he's catching every day. And all of a sudden, he wins the job. And he's leading us to the, to the one game from the World Series. And the guys want to throw to him. He's not framing jack shit. He's just, he's just, you know, catching the ball. And he's, he's engaged. He's engaged with the pitcher, and he's, he's making that pitcher execute. And that team is, is impacted because of the way they execute it. And um, I think of guys like that, man. There, there's a lot of favorite moments. So I don't have any one favorite player, um, and uh, best player, nah. What, what about the deaf guy? Was he your favorite player? The deaf guy? The, the deaf guy is a, a tremendous human being. The fact that he fell for that for so long, that the guy, <laughs> Francoeur, Francoeur did an interview. Check it out, guys. Francoeur did an interview with a deaf radio station. Let that one set in for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and as he was doing the interview, he was talking really slow. Hi, I'm Jeff Francoeur from the El Paso Chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, he's a he's a beautiful who, man. Who was the one that who was the one that they pranked about that? Francoeur. Frank oh, they, they they pranked yeah. Francoeur. Yeah, who was the guy but that pretended this, to be deaf? Yeah, who was the setup? A pitcher. George George Reyes. George Reyes. George Reyes. It has to be a pitcher. It has to be a pitcher. And I did it. I did it maybe six years in a row. And I never intended it to be videotaped. That was Decker's idea. But I, I never, I never uh, intended that. What I intended is that it's, you pull this off for that period of time, it's really kind of brings the team together. And I don't mean to offend any of the deaf uh, people out there or anything like that. It was just meant to be in, in, in all good natured. And some of the stories we have is fantastic. But then Frank Coeur, took it to another level. I mean, he had dinner with him and his wife. He had dinner with George and his wife and talked to him like, hey, you guys don't sign language. How do you talk? Oh, we just text. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen, by the way, if you haven't seen the video, it's online. Yes. Just type in Jeff Francoeur Chihuahuas and it comes up right away. It's, of course. it's a great three or four minutes. It got a lot of play. It's, it's incredible. It was incredible that he that he just never realized it. And the way it came up, first day of spring training, he got to spring training late. He was with another team. Padres sign him. They go, hey, Murph, you got a new guy today. We had about five days left before the season. You got Frank Cora. I'm like, oh, really? I never met him. So he comes up to me first day, and he goes, hey, Murph, how are you? Hey, Jeff, look, we're going to get you back to the big leagues. 
you're going to, you're going to bat fourth or fifth every day. Have a great time. Don't tell me when you need a day, but I want you to grab some ABs. So when the time comes May 1st, you're, you're ready to roll. And, uh, he goes, Oh, thanks Murph. Whatever. I said, just be, I'll be there every day for you. Just, I'm going to be open. You'll be open with me with what's going on. And, um, and then, oh, by the way, Jeff, we got a death kit. You'll, you'll figure it out. We got a death <laughs> kit, so just be be aware of it. He goes, really? I go, yeah. I goes, that's really cool. I said, yeah, just be aware of it. And walked away. And then from that point forward, we had to pick out the guy, figure out who it was going to be. And I knew I had him right then. Cause... <laughs> that delivery was good right there. That's perfect. <laughs> the way yeah. if you know if it was Frenchy, delivered like that, then forget it. If you know Frenchie, too, he's the, he's the nicest guy, so he doesn't he really doesn't want to offend anybody. Yeah, so as soon did. as Murph said it, he was probably like, man, I'm going to start learning sign language. Yeah. You know? I mean, you just have to know Frenchie. You guys are. You guys he's are great. A, he's a great. Treat. Well, Pat, it was so great to catch up with you. Appreciate having you on. Um, good luck the rest of the week here, and uh, we'll talk again soon, all right? Thanks, you guys. I love seeing you guys. All right, so this team is hanging on at the top of the division, but barely, and it's not just the Pirates playing better than expected. It's not just the Cardinals rebounding a bit. It's the Cincinnati Reds playing inspiring ball, and a huge weekend set against this ball club includes the possibility – of Ellie De La Cruz making his debut at some point. It'll make people salivate to watch it. He's hitting dingers, but the Brewers got to come through here and come into the division rivals, the weird division rivals, the Reds. How many times do you say that? This might be a hot-ish take, but I've actually got Ellie De La Cruz projecting better than Jackson Churio. I said it on Brew Crew territory. I'm sorry about it. Kratzy disagrees. We'll get into it another time, especially when both of them get up to the show. So... For now, thank you for watching Brew Crew Territory. A lot more for you next week, including Roddy Telez returns.